Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you tell us in your word that the idols of old were a burden to the beast that carried them. And yet we carry our idols in our pockets. You tell us the idols of old had mouths but did not speak. Our idol speaks. Siri speaks. You tell us that when we cried out to those idols of old that they are no help. But our idols give us directions when we are lost, point us to food when we're hungry, tell us where to buy clothes when we're naked, helps us order medicine when we're sick, even helps us pay for the things that we need. God, we are an idolatrous people. Just because our idols are different doesn't mean that they're not idols. And the more sophisticated we become, the more our idols become like us. They hear, they speak, they even think. But God, our idols are not in your image. We were created in your image. We are divine image bearers. And being divine image bearers ourselves, it is not proper to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or rock or stone. An image formed by the art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance you overlook, but now you command all men everywhere to repent because you have fixed a day on which you will judge the world in righteousness by a man. In this reality, you have given assurance to us all by raising this man from the dead. There is a day coming, God, when we will stand before you and give an account. And those who are not in Christ should be very afraid, Lord, but you tell us in your word that in Christ we are loved with a perfect love, a love that casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So I pray today, God, for those who are stuck in idolatrous worship, that you will open their eyes to see the glory, the glory that's in your word, your testimony about yourself, and that seeing the illegitimacy of their idol over and against your legitimate glory in person, that they would forsake the trinkets that this world has to offer and run with open arms to receive the greatest treasure of all eternity, you, in the person of your Son. And I pray for those of us who have embraced you as our treasure, that we would continue to be given eyes to see you as glorious as you really are that we would not be drawn back to all that flashes and glitters in this world, but that we would forsake all, holding on to you and being confident that since we own you, because of your love for us, we own everything. We thank you for that, God. May your love shine forth in this word. Keep me from error, guide me in truth, and be with, with those who listen. Give them a supernatural attention span so that I don't seem boring. And more importantly, so that you don't seem boring. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you like symmetry, you should like the New Testament because it begins in the same manner in which it ends. All right? So the New Testament begins with the arrival of Christ. The incarnate Christ comes in the flesh and he sleeps in the feeding trough of an animal, maybe even a donkey, as a baby. But as an adult, he rides into the city of the king, Jerusalem, on the back of a donkey. And this triumphal entry is accompanied by praises like, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna! Thrilled to see this king riding in on, in on the back of a donkey. That's how the New Testament begins. 
This is how the New Testament ends in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. Listen to the imagery of when Jesus comes back. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. There's no more donkey. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness He judges and He makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on His head are many diadems, and He has a name written that no one knows but Himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which He is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the Almighty God. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And the cries of Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are replaced with, O rocks, fall on me. Hide me from the wrath of the one who is sitting on the throne and of the Lamb for their great day of of wrath has come and who can stand? No one can. Now with this image in your mind, I want you to read what John says in 1 John 4, 17 and 18. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as He is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love. There's no no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. The love of God with which you have been loved and with which you love others is not wimpy or whimsical. It's not. It's pervasive. It is so pervasive. Think about how pervasive this love is. The one who saw with his eyes the revelation of the wrath of God responds to the Lamb's comments, Behold, I am coming quickly with Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Can you imagine beholding a sight that terrible And your response to his coming is, come on, come Lord Jesus. Yes, yes, here is the horse and his rider. There he is. This love is so profound that it changes the way we see Christ in his wrath. You don't fear that imagery. You welcome it. And you love it. Only those perfected by that kind of love can welcome the horse of judgment and its rider. That's it. Only perfect love casts out fear. And if you're in Christ, what John says emphatically is that you have been loved with such a love. You've been loved with such a love. Therefore, fear of judgment and love is incompatible in the life of a Christian. We see this in 1 John 4, 18 and 19. He says that there's no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Verse 19, we love. Don't don't miss the contrast there. On the one hand, there are those who, who fear and they have not been perfected in love. Okay, And then on the other hand, we have those that actually love in verse 19. You see what John's doing? We're not like these people. We're not like the people that have not been perfected in love and that fear judgment. Rather, contrarily, on the other hand, we love. We love. We're not them. We don't do that. We don't do fear. We do love. That's what it means to be a Christian. See, for John, this is not a gray issue. It's black and white. It is a black and white issue. There's no room for it. Fear of punishment and love of God are like oil and water. 
Just like oil and they don't mix. You can't mix them together. In fact, it's always been possible for us to draw near to God in love while we run away from Him in fear. That's really what you're saying. When you're saying that you can fear punishment on one hand and love God on the other, you're saying that it is possible for you to draw near to God in love while you run from Him in fear. It's not possible. Those are two different things, right? And, And you don't have to go very far in the Bible to figure this out. When John writes and says, I'm not writing a new command to you. I'm writing what I heard from the beginning. He's being very literal. Genesis 3, 8, and 9. This is implicit. Listen, to after Adam and Eve sin against God, they eat the forbidden fruit. This is the author's description. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. You can't draw near to God in love when He's walking in the cool of the garden and you hear Him when you're afraid of Him. When you're afraid of Him, you hide. You hide among the trees. I was afraid of you, therefore I hid. Now listen to what God does in Genesis 3.24. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There is no abiding language in the book of Genesis. There's none. There's none. It involves sin being cast out of the presence of God because of sin, and an angel guarding the source of life symbolically so that we would know, hey, they are cast out in a really big time way. Not only were they thrown out of God's presence, they're cut off from life. That's what it means. The only people, ca- there, there's no abiding language in Genesis. It's casting out. Cast, get out of here. Get out of my face. Get away from life. Now, By nature, this is who we are. This is who we are by nature. We come out of our mother's womb naked, just like Adam, and we spend the majority of our life hiding from God. Hiding from God. Either hiding behind the tree, hiding behind the sin in which we're committing, okay, and amongst the trees, or if that doesn't work, We'll hide our nakedness behind our own fig leaves that we sew for a garment. I mean, that's just what we do. We hide behind our sin or we try to remedy our sin and hide behind it. Either way, we try to hide from God. We're naked. This is who we are by nature. But the good news is that His story is not ours. That's the good news of the gospel. Yes, that's who you are. But no, His story is not yours. In our story... God does not cast us away to live a life of persistent, perpetual fear. Rather, He cast out our fear by His abiding presence. See that? In Genesis, Adam's cast out and he was afraid. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, because of the blood of Christ, God doesn't cast us out when we're afraid. He cast out our fear. By remaining with us. It's the complete opposite. Listen to how many times in 1 John 4, 12 through 17, that John uses the word abide. All right? Just, just, we're going to read it. It's just listen. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him. And He in us, that's the, so there's the verb there is, is assumed, abides in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He abides in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in Him. Is John's point clear? John is focused here on the fruit of love that comes from abiding. This is not a legalistic book that you're supposed to read and somehow love more. That's not the overall message of 1 John. 
Love more. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, get a grasp. Let the gospel grip you in such a way that you become aware, cognizant of your abiding in God. You're partaking of the divine nature. You're admitted into the blessed Trinity by the blood of Jesus Christ and being admitted into that which has been loved from all of eternity. Let that reality produce in you love for other people. That's the point. It's the abiding that produces the love. Now look at what happens in verse 18. The abiding language ceases, okay? And John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. God does nothing with Adam and Eve's fear. He just removes them from His presence. Those in Christ, He cast out our fear by never casting us out of His presence. Now, this works in two ways, right? So this is, all that's well and good, right? But, but God knows how we're designed and wired. And so some of you might be thinking, all right, well, so what? I mean, it sounds, this is interesting, maybe. Some of you are, this is not interesting at all. But how does it work? Well, it works in the indwelling sphere and the outworking sphere. Or to say it maybe a little differently, it works propositionally and practically. And those relate to one another. When you understand a propositional truth, the way in which it's meant to be understood, then it should affect you in a practical way. That's what's the way it works. So these are separate, but they're related to each other, okay? So what we're going to talk about now is what God communicates to us propositionally, the best He can to our finite minds about what it means to be part of Him in Jesus Christ. So, the fact that we abide in God and God abides in us means that the indwelling of God fundamentally changes who we are. This is unlike any relationship that you're in right now. This changes you unlike any other relationship has changed you. You think marriage has changed you? You think having a child has changed you? You think having a grandchild has changed you? <laughs> No, those are but the hem of the garment of what it means to be changed by God abiding in you. This relationship is deeper and more profound than anyone you can imagine. The closest is marriage. The parable of marriage represents Christ's relationship with the church. All right? But it's just a parable. It's not the real thing. It's tainted by sin. The indwelling of God fundamentally changes who we are. We see this in verses 16 and 17. It says, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, a God abides in Him. There's all that abiding language, right? In verse 17 it says, by this is love perfected with us. Now stop right there. When you get to that point in Scripture, you should ask yourself, what does the by this refer to? Does it point forwards or does it point backwards? By what? By what is love perfected with us? In this case, it points, back, it points backwards. Love is perfected with us, along with us. So love is perfected in us. We are perfected by us abiding in God and God abiding in us. The fact that God abides in you means that He changes you. He perfects you. This change is so profound that John goes on to say that so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. So your connection to God, God abiding in you, and you abiding to God is so profound and so real that it gives you confidence to meet this rider on the white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth to rule the nations, to tread them under his foot like the wine press of God's fury. You can be confident in front of this guy. Why? Well, because as he is, so also are we in this world. Your connection to God through Jesus Christ is what God removes, uses to remove our fear. God removes our fear of judgment by making us like 
the judge. That's John's point. You can have confidence for the day of judgment because you're just like the judge. You are just like the judge. The judge abides in you and you abide in the judge. You are so connected to God in holiness, in righteousness, and in love that a pronouncement of unrighteousness against you by the judge would be a pronouncement of unrighteousness by the judge against himself. That's how connected you are. I know we don't see it. It's impossible for us to see it. All we see are our mistakes. It's all we see when we look in the mirror. I'm not like him. I'm not even a good person. Rejoice! Good people go to hell. Saved people go to heaven. You're saved. You're like the judge. Now, when John says that God perfects our love in us, what does he mean? I think that's important because, well, for me anyway, because I spent all my life not knowing what he meant. But I still may not know what he meant. I'm going to try to answer the question and you test it, okay? But here's my attempt at answering that question. When John says that God is love in verse 16, I take that to mean that love is what God is in his innermost being. Or say it a little differently. One of the things that it means to be God is to be love in your innermost being. You can describe God accurately by saying He's love. It's an accurate description of God. It's what it means to be God. Love is a divine attribute of God that is completely different from the rest of His attributes because Unlike the other attributes, love is the only divine attribute that's exercised within himself first before it is bent horizontally towards us. So wrath, mercy, grace, they're all attributes of God. But none of these attributes are attributes that God bends inward first. God's not gracious towards himself. He has no need of grace. God's not wrathful towards himself. He's not under his wrath. He's not merciful towards himself. He has no need of mercy. Love, however, is an attribute that is first shared within the Trinity, within the persons of the Trinity first, and then bended out towards us to partake in. And here's how we know that this attribute has always existed in God. Because what Jesus says in John 17, 24, he says, God loved me before the foundation of the world. Think about that. God the Father loves Christ the Son before the foundation of the world. That is the attribute that exists within God the Father, the person of the Spirit, the person of the Son. Not three gods, three persons making up one God the Christian triune God. So one of the things that it means to be God is to somehow in some way share a perfect, unbreakable love in yourself, perfectly, and perfectly bend it out horizontally, right? Furthermore, being in the image of God, it is also fitting that we too should be love in our innermost being. In other words, what I'm saying is, what it means to be human at its root is to be love. This is affirmed in the use of the words inhumane and humane. Treatment that is of anybody or anything that is cruel or unreasonable or unloving or compassionless is called inhumane. Why? Because being the opposite of those things is what it means to be human. It's what it means to act in a humane way a way that's fitting for a human to act. So, even in our fallenness, we affirm in a very sinful way that what it really means to be truly human is to be love. But there's a problem. Even when we are as human as we can be, our love is not perfect apart from Christ because apart from Christ, 
we are not perfectly human. When you are as humane as you can be apart from Christ, you are completely inhumane. <laughs> because being in Christ is what it means to be human. The sin of Adam and Eve altered what it means to be human because it separated us from the one who made us and who also happens to be the source of all love. In order for love to be perfect, perfect love, it must derive from a perfect source, be carried out through a perfect power, and be to the praise of a perfect person. That's what it means to have perfect love. But because of sin, we don't love perfectly. We love idolatrously. Because the source of our love, more often than not, is an image of God. It's powered by the image of God. And it resounds to the praise of something that's in the image of God. Our love, our love for one another is so fickle, right? I mean, Jesus saw it. If you love those who love you, what benefit do you have? Even tax collectors do that. Our love for other people, more often than not, is tied to what we receive from them. So more often than not, the source of our love is us. As long as our love for somebody else pats our back in human praise, then we find the power to love them and the energy to love them. It's all idolatrous. God reverses this tragedy by sending Christ into the world as a human being so that we might love others the same way that God loves himself. That's the point. Listen to what Jesus says in John 15, verse 9. Jesus is going to describe the manner in which he loved others. John 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Think about that. When Jesus loves the people that are around him, it's none other than Trinitarian love that's existed from all of eternity bent horizontally for the people that are in his presence to receive. And by taking this Trinitarian eternal love and bending it horizontally, he shows us what God is like. Do you want to know what God's like? What is God like on a fundamental level? Here's what God is like according to Scripture. God, within each person of the Trinity, relates to himself. Each person of the Trinity relates to the other in perfect humility, in perfect submission, and in perfect love. There's no power grab among the members of God. There's none. The Son submits to the will of the Father. The Father hands over the kingdom to His Son. And the Spirit submits to the Father and to the Son by being sent out to point people to the supremacy of the Son. And none of them are jealous of one another. The Son never looks at the Father and says, Why do I got to take their sins? It's perfect love, perfect submission within God Himself. That's what God is like. And when that love becomes flesh, it looks like a man who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead emptied himself by looking like any other man. And by becoming obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. That is what it means to be God. And it is what it means to be human. We were not made to scratch every 
itch. Being human is not having the ability to go to Starbucks whenever you want to go or to smell cookies or pretzels in the bakery of a mall and submit to that desire and please yourself whenever you want. That's not what it means to be human. God did not design you to be that way. That's not the way God is. That's not the way God is. God did not please himself. Jesus did not scratch one inch, but he scratched all of yours. All of yours. That's what it means to be God. And that's what it means to be human. Christ came to show us what it's like to be a human person, a real human person. It's not acting authoritatively, autonomously, with regard to no one else. It's what I want to do. That's not the way God works. Think about that. The fact that there are three persons in this Trinitarian God in perfect community and submission to the authority of the other in perfect love and obedience is profound in regards to the way we are to relate to one another. That's why Paul says, don't let any one of you count the other more significant than yourself. God doesn't do that in the Trinity. Why do you do it? It's this point. Okay. Not only does Christ show us what Trinitarian love looks like, in His death, He redeems us and our imperfect love by dying on the cross and securing God's abiding presence in our life. Because Christ abides in us, we abide in the love of the Trinity and are now able to love others with a perfect divine love since we too, by our connection with Christ, have been made perfect and divine. And since our love is Trinitarian in nature now, it's no longer idolatrous. It doesn't proceed from an image or derive its power from an image or resound to our praise. It is from God and through God and to God. That's what it means to love like God. All things are from Him, through Him, and to Him is what Paul tells us in Romans. And it's the same with our love. It's from, the, it's from God as a source through the strength that He supplies to His glorious grace. That's what it means to love like God to love like a human. And it's this reason, for this reason, that the fear of judgment and love are incompatible. John does not say that God is fear. He says God is love. And since God is love in His innermost being, it is impossible for you to be connected to the divine through Jesus Christ and have divine love abide in you, and you abide in divine love, and be fearful of the one in whom you abide. Think about that. People that continually walk around in fear of the judgment of God, most of them probably do so for good reason. They should probably be afraid, most of them. Some of them just don't understand. It is, just, it is just impossible for you to live a life fearful of judgment and be connected to the judge as it is or was for Adam and Eve to remain in God's presence after they sinned. So, the first way this works is God indwells us, connects us to Himself. We become partakers of the divine nature, which is what Peter says in 1 Peter. And we are, by the blood of Christ, granted access into this blessed Holy Trinity, into perfect love, a love that perfects us, and a love that bends itself outwards to other people. From God, through God, and to God. The next way this works is in the outworking all right. <clears throat> God knows we need more than propositional truth to banish fear of judgment. So what does he give us? The Holy Spirit, 1 John 4, 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit, which is great news. 
Because where do you go when you don't love like God loves, right? <laughs> where do you go? Oh, the fruit's not there. Well, that's when the Spirit comes in. It says, oh, you are a child. It brings you to repentance. Reassures you of the perfect love of Christ, His perfect righteousness. Picks you up and you go out to love better. All right? But we do bear the fruit of love. And it's so that we might know that God abides in us. Love is not the cause of God's abiding. It's the effect. You don't love somebody else so God can abide in you. God abides in you so that you can love somebody else. So we know this because John says this in 1 John 4, 19. We love because He first loved us. So John wants us to see. Where does our love come from? It comes from a prior love. God's love of you. That's why you love. You love and don't fear. You do the opposite of fear. You love because God loves you. This is important because it helps us relate to God's commands. Okay? John is going to call love a command. And in our sinful nature, it's a natural progression to take the command to love and look at it through a legalistic lens and make it the basis by which we become partakers of the divine nature. I'm going to show you why that's a natural tendency later. But John is going to call this a command, and he wants us to be able to relate to it. And we're going to see next week that the world would have us believe that God's commands are burdensome at worst, okay? And are notorious at best. So if it can fool you into thinking it's a burden, it's going to do that. If it can't fool you into thinking God's a burden, His commands are a burden, well, it'll just, He'll take that little railroad track that's meant to guide us to God, turn it vertically in, into a stairway to heaven and say, climb it! Get up there. <clears throat> John does not see the commands this way. He sees the commands as the means to bring about the gracious fruit of our salvation. And the way he structures these last concluding sentences help us see this. So, after he tells us that God's love for us is the cause of our love for others, he says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. I'm in verse 20 of 1 John 4. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. The key to understanding this verse is the word seen because it reminds us of what he says in 1 John 4, 12. Practically the same thing. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So what does our love for our brothers show us? Read it again. If we love one another, then God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. So what do you know by love when you love somebody else? What is one reality that you know when you love someone else for the love of Christ? God abides in me. Loving one another shows us that, and it is proof that God has changed you. Verse 19 gives the ground of our love. We love because He first loved us. And verse 20 reminds us that this act of love serves as proof that we are in God. We're in God. You love. And which brings us to verse 21. In verse 21, John reminds us that love is a commandment. And this is the command that we have from him, that we love one another. So why does John remind us that this is a commandment? And if you read forward into chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, you get insight as to why. Because John is going to make this statement in 1 John 5, 3. God's commands are not burdensome. That is important because it tells us that John not only wants us to see what God's commands are, he wants us to relate to God's commands the right way. It's wrong to look at the command of God and say, Oh, what a burden. What a joy kill. Can't have any fun with this God. No fun. No fun God. That's not the way we are to look at the commands. They're not burdensome. That's the wrong way to view them. The reason that the command to love is not a burden is because obeying the command is evidence or fruit that points to our change. In other words, the reason that God commands you to love the way that He loves, there's a lot of reasons. One of them is this. It's so that when you obey the command, 
you have an inward testimony through your obedience that your faith is real. God gives you commands so that when you keep them, you can know that you're changed. The fact that you keep them points to the reality that you're changed. Rebels don't keep God's commands. Rebellious Israel did not keep God's commands. But when you keep them, you know I'm not rebellious Israel because I do the opposite of what they have done. You see what God does here? We automatically look at all commands as legalistic. They're not. They're means that God uses to supply what He demands and that He uses to encourage us that, hey, I'm changed. I'm changed. I'm loving like I've never loved. I'm changed. It's real. I'm not fake. I'm not a fake. I'm not a fake. Oh my goodness, I'm not a fake. There's no fear in that, is there? There's no fear in that. The command to love is for God's glory and for our good. So we glorify God when the origin of our love is from Him, when the energy of our love is through Him, when the praise of our love is to Him, and when He casts out our fear by abiding in us. And when He gives us commands to follow that show that He abides in us, and when we follow those commands and we get that assurance that our faith is real and legitimate, and you combine that with the Spirit that cries, Abba, Father, there's no love. There's no fear in love. There's no fear in love. There can't be. Because God is going to work in a thousand different ways to drive it out. So if you're sinful and you don't love like you should, the Holy Spirit flies in, convicts you of the sin, brings you to repentance, shows you the perfect love of Christ that never messed up, and you go there for your love. And then when you do obey, you look at the fruit of your obedience, how it was brought about, who gets the praise and the glory, and you're reminded that, yes, I am real because I love. God's designed all these things so that you can know you're His. You don't have to fear the white hood. You welcome Him. Come on. Ride the pony, Jesus. Bring us justice. Bring us Vengeance against our enemies, rule and righteousness, reign. Stop on the grapes of your wine press in fury. I'll help you stop on them. We judge, we will judge the world with Christ. You are partakers with Christ in a profound way. All right. <clears throat> Let's apply it. Three applications. What does this do? What's this reality do? How does it shape my life? Number one, it removes the disappointment and licentiousness and legalism by pointing us to grace. Okay? So, when we misunderstand God's love, we become either licentious or legalistic. Now, now some people wonder why I'm so hard on legalists, right? And they think that I might have a, you know, a certain group of people in mind. Well, I, I do. The reason I'm, I'm so hard on legalists is because I am one. That's why. To my core, apart from Christ, I am a Pharisee in that sense. Now, but the other reason I'm hard on legalism is because legalism is not a Baptist problem. It's not a Presbyterian problem. It's not a Church of Christ problem. It's not a Methodist problem. It's a people problem. That's why I'm hard on it. Because, here's the thing, you're going to be one or two. You're either going to be licentious in the way you act, or you're going to be a legalist in the way you act. And licentiousness always leads you to legalism. I'm going to show you. This is Genesis 3, 6 through 7. This is a natural pro progression of what we do in our sin. When Eve saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she said, come here, husband. Here. And he took of it and he ate. That is licentiousness. That's what it means. Unrestrained morality. It looks good. It smells good. It's going to taste good. It's going to do good things for me. I'll have it. 
Look how quickly licentiousness turns into legalism. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loincloths. One verse. They go from licentious people who want to be justified in what they're doing to people that want to be justified by what they're doing. <laughs> Which tells you this. You know, what, you know what legalism is? It's licentiousness dressed up like a priest. That's all it is. It's licentiousness dressed up like a priest. It just looks religious now. And they're, they're both void of any power to bring about godliness. The licentious wants to be justified in what they do. The legalist, legalist wants to be justified by what they do. And both reject grace. Which says, that's not the way I divvy justification. And when you focus solely on yourself, all that you'll get is disappointment. So if you're a licentious person in sin, and you think you can justify your sin by the, your life situation, or it's been this long since I've done something. I mean, it's been 25 years since I lost my temper. Sure, I beat a guy to a bloody pulp because I lost my temper five minutes ago. But in the grand scheme of things, what's five minutes of, against 25 years? That's a licentious person turned legalist. It's a shoddy cloth garment. As soon as you put it on, it falls. The second thing. This love removes the paralysis of fear of people by uniting us to someone greater than people. One of the reasons that we don't love like Christ loves is because we are afraid. And if we're not afraid of judgment, the judgment of God, we're afraid of the judgment of others. Which is silly, isn't it? Who in Athens is going to come up to you riding on a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth with a name on his thigh? King of kings, Lord of lords, ruling the nation with the iron. Who's going to... Who? No one is. But yeah, we're, we're scared to death of people. Can't cross them on the squats. Go around this way. <laughs> I mean... And you know what happens when you do that? You know what happens when you're that afraid? You're paralyzed from doing anything you want to do. Listen to... This is Matthew 4, 3 through 10. I, I love this passage. Because it, what it, this passage shows me is you don't have to be a member of ISIS to be capable of beheading somebody. You just have to love the praise of man more than the praise of God. That's all. Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Look at verse 5. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people. Because they held him to be a prophet. So verse 5, I want to kill this guy. But I can't even do what I want to do because all these people think he's a prophet. Ah! Verse 6. But when Herod's birthday came, this could, is, this, is this evidence that grown people should not have birthday parties? I don't know. <laughs> the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. Verse 9. And the king was sorry. Think about this. In verse 5, he wanted him put to death, but he couldn't because he was afraid of the people. In verse 9, he's approached with what he wanted in verse 5, but he was sorry. So he didn't want to do it. Look what happens next. But because of his oaths, and his guests, he commanded it to be given. That is the definition of a slave. The thing he wanted to do, he couldn't do because the people, he feared what would happen. And then the very thing that he didn't want to do later, he had to do because he feared, of what, would, he feared what would happen with the people. That's a terrible way to live your life. It's a terrible way to live your life. And it's completely unloving. Understanding that you have been connected to the judge of every human being should free you 
from the paralysis of being judged by other human beings. If this got into us, think of how bold we could be with the gospel. Think about how bold we could be with our coworkers. You wouldn't have to walk down a certain aisle at the grocery store because you see a certain person. Or you wouldn't have to get nervous when a certain person comes into work because they might know something about you. You might not be, you might be emboldened to talk to your spouse in a loving way about the gospel because you see them going down a road that's not the gospel. And number three, this reality grounds love in someone more worthy than the ones we love and in someone more dependable than us. One of the reasons we have a hard time loving people is because they're not worthy of our love, and you're right. Most people aren't. People are generally terrible. I love being a pastor. It'd be great if I didn't have people. That's not true. But people are hard. People are hard, right? People are hard. So look, in 1 John 4, 11, John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. See what John does there in a very subtle way? When the temptation to not love someone else arises because of the difference you have with them, God doesn't say, look for common ground with that person and then figure out how to love. He says, look at the way that God loved you. And that person, you are infinitely more different to God as a sinner than that person is to you as a sinner. At least you have your sin in common. And He loved you infinitely. And suddenly, those chains of worth are broken. You say, okay, you are the ground of my love. I'm going to love. And not only is He the ground of your love, He's the source of it. Your love's independable, but He's not. Which is what 1 John 4 19 is really all about. We love because He first loved us. So when we're independable with our selfish, sinless, or sinful love, it's the love of Christ compels us or controls us and makes us love others whom we wouldn't love. All right, so those are the takeaways. Let's end by going to God in prayer and asking Him to do something special for the people that aren't believers and for the people that are. Let's pray. God, we thank You for the love with which You loved us, how You drove out fear and banished it from our lives. And I just pray now for those who are not Yours, who stand under Your wrath, that You would send Your Spirit so that they can see Christ lifted up and be drawn to the One who paid their debt decisively, finally, completely, eternally that in running to Christ they might dance in adoration and praise because your wrath has been graciously removed from them and poured out on the person of Jesus I want you to do that God for those who aren't believing and for those of us who are Lord enlarge our view of the greatness of Christ make us aware of the love with which we've been loved and empower us to love other people from you, through you, and to you. For our good, for, their, for, the, for your witness in their life, and for the glory of your great name. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.